everyone, and welcome back to another exciting iSoccer podcast. Uh, my name is Chris McGowan. I'm the Principal Information Security Professional Practice Lead here at Isaka. Uh, joining me today is Dan Ventura. He's a manager of product security incident response teams at Adobe. Uh, welcome, Dan. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, before we dive into full conversation, I was hoping you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at Adobe. Yeah, sure. So, yep, my name is Dan. I'm the manager of the PCER team here at Adobe. I've been at Adobe for about three and a half years. Um, and right now, our team can generally be categorized in as being responsible for the adversary management aspect of Adobe. Um, so some of the main pillars that our team is responsible for is number one, adversary takedowns. Anytime there's a threat actor taking advantage of or abusing one of our products, my team will go in, investigate, and perform that takedown, whether that be disabling an account or taking down a malicious hosted page. The second responsibility that we are uh, uh, that we take ownership of is the bug bounty program and uh, responsible disclosure program. Uh, we have a bug bounty program hosted on the HackerOne platform. Um, and the last responsibility is supporting the incident response process. Uh, anytime there's a security incident at Adobe, uh, my team will go in and, and support that that facilitation. Oh, nice. It sounds like you've got a, a wide variety of things your team's responsible for. Uh, before we, like, we'll dive a little bit into all those, those sections um, eventually, but I was I was just curious. I, I host a lot of podcasts, and I always am curious to ask the people that I'm hosting, uh, how did you get into this field? You know, how did you uh, find that this is what you wanted to do? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so back in college, I was actually started out in electrical engineering, um, just because I kind of ran in the family. I didn't really know what else I, I should do. Um, I quickly found out that electrical engineering was not my cup of tea, um, and then looked into a, a shift in, in degrees and realized I, I was a big fan of IT and computers. Um, I, I build computers in my free time. Um, and so I decided to, to invest some time and effort into uh, learning about cyber and cybersecurity was a natural fit there. Nice. I mean, it's, it's always nice to hear, um, you know, where people got their start. Cause me, like you, you know, I joined the military to get out of the, uh, not doing it and not having a job. And I joined the Navy to do something. I didn't like what it was. And then I was like, what's this cyber thing when it came real big on the government side. And, uh, you know, my life totally changed after that. I just really love to hear people's stories to see, you know, it's not too late for anyone to really get into the field if they're interested in it. Right. Uh, thanks for that. Um, so you, you talked about some of the things that you're, yourself and your team are responsible for. Um, before we get into the bug bounty thing, because I, I'm really interested in that, because in all honesty, I don't know a whole lot about it. So through our conversation, I'm, I'm hoping to actually learn something. How does your team work? you know, to, to derive or figure out, you know, what adversaries are up to? Yeah, good question. Um, so we, we started this project about a year and a half ago. We came to the understanding that adversaries are very different. They're dynamic and skilled, uh, the different type of threat actors posing uh, uh, threats to our products. Uh, and so, like I said, they have different skill sets, different motives, different personalities, different backgrounds, and such. Our products and services, the mitigations that we build out for these products need to be different. So for a broad example, right, you have a script kitty, somebody that's not super technical, somebody that's probably using automated tools or, or, or scanners that are already open sourced or publicly available. Um, their time investment is minimal. Uh, their, their, their wins are, are generally on the lower side of the financial spectrum. If you compare that adversary of a script kitty versus a nation state actor, for example, nation state actor is going to act and behave completely different. They're going to have different motives, different backgrounds, different TTPs. Um, and so the, the mitigations as we work with our, our products and services to put in place to build resilience against those threat actors are also going to be completely different. No, I'm I'm really glad you touched on that point because, I mean, people with a security background can obviously understand the fact that, you know, I'm in cybersecurity. Uh, I I use network defense. Uh, it's not just having a password protection and all these different layers. I mean, to I mean, I'm gonna ask your opinion. 
if to be truly, you know, really good in our field, you, you have to have that mindset. It's not just a narrow path to do to defend or find or whatever it may be. I'm um, in the cyber world, you, you have to think outside the box, you have to have like a wide array of knowledge of different adversarial, you know, TTPs, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and I'm also a big, big believer in uh, security fatigue. Um, you know, I think it's not uncommon to Adobe as much as other companies as well, that there is a ton of audits, compliance, security findings that we throw at our engineering teams to make sure that they are up to date with the latest protections. Um, so much so that we they probably don't even have enough time as they would like to work on new feature requests and, and things like that. So measuring adversaries and their personas and mapping that against which products are likely to be impacted by those personas is our effort to prioritize the most important type of uh, mitigations and resilience that we can build for that particular product. Well, wow, that's, that's interesting. Uh, it makes me, you know, ask another question. Do you utilize any capabilities of any other kind of teams to to help you to, you know, do your mission? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So we have a, a bunch of different teams in Adobe Security that are working to emulate these type of personas. Um, it's obviously ideal for our internal testing teams to beat these adversaries to the vulnerabilities before they can be exploited in the wild. So we do leverage a, a ton of um, external penetration testing teams, internal penetration testing teams. We have our own red team um, that is all that they're all working to emulate these type of adversaries um, and, and really deep dive and understand uh, the true impact of some of these uh, vulnerabilities. Yeah, that's that's interesting because uh, in my past career, um, I've worked on a couple different uh, red teams. It's it's on the government side, so sometimes it's a little different than industry. But um, I can see how utilizing the penetration testing and all those different aspects. I don't know if blue team would be so much um, a benefit to your job specifically, but understanding that it takes more than just the knowledge of your team to be successful, right? You got to lean on other teams to, you know, to do your job better, I guess you'd say. Yeah. One of the ways that we really look to, to measure these adversaries and their personas um, is through adversary Intel. Uh, we have a, a brilliant team here at Adobe that is specifically responsible for developing these personas and measuring adversary Intel, things that are going on in the wild, um, exploits that are happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and, and so we use that almost as our source of truth where we, you know, we will point and steer our penetration testing teams. We'll steer our red team into campaigns of um, different types of exploits going on in the wild and, and understanding what impact that could have to Adobe if it were to happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you, you hit it on perfectly. Um, learning basically what bad guys are doing currently and emulating that to um, test or make sure that you're not vulnerable for the same situation, right? Because it, yeah. I remember um, cybersecurity of the olden days was uh, run these scans and no matter how old they were, they weren't updated as much as they are these days. Um, but people who really uh, were involved in the job are like, I get it, we're looking for exploits that have been around for you know, 10 years at the time, and this could have been close to 20 years ago, to be honest. Uh, things yeah. have changed and the the threat landscape has changed quite a bit and is ever evolving, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I know there's a, a lot of the CVEs that are being exploited in the wild on a day-to-day -day basis sometimes have, you know, uh, automated tools or scanners or POCs on, on GitHub, things that are readily available to be exploited. Um, and so what we do with our adversary Intel and our bug bounty team is that type of data will usually demonstrate the initial access, right? Just kind of dipping your toes in the water, demonstrating there, there's a vulnerability here. And what we'll do is then we'll mobilize our internal testing team to really deep dive that particular exploit to, to further emulate that adversary. A really good example of that is with um, you know, an e-commerce platform. Right. Generally, an e-commerce platform might be more susceptible to uh, credit card skimmers. And so if we are measuring that in the wild, right, maybe other other e-commerce platforms are fa falling victim to that exploit. 
um, it would be a good indicator for us to spend some time uh, in emulating that specific adversary and identifying any internal e-commerce platforms that we could build out uh, resilience to. Yeah, that that's a perfect example, and thank you for that. So you you touch slightly on uh, uh, the bug bounty. Um, can we start diving into that a little bit? Because I we've talked about some great things with uh, adversary emulation and trying to you know figure out what what's going on in the world and what's relevant, and then how to use it. But but so explain to me if you don't mind a little bit about the bug bounty programs. Sure. So from a high level, a bug bounty or responsible disclosure program is a tool used to incentivize the responsible disclosure of vulnerabilities to a company. Um, This could be just third party bug bounty hunters doing this as a hobby. It could be a customer finding a vulnerability in an Adobe product. It could be a you know, graduate student doing a thesis on some Adobe product that they, you know, stumble upon a vulnerability. We provide that outlet for responsible disclosure instead of having the vulnerability, you know, tweeted about or written in a blog post or or something that we would have to take a reactive approach to. So preventative is always better than reactive when it can, you know, be beneficial. And I know sometimes it's more difficult. So how do you, you mentioned incentivize. How, is it difficult to get people to uh, from all over the place to to be a part of this program? Um, the biggest difficulty there is the competition with other companies that are also hosting bug bounty platforms. Um, so there's a bunch of, there, there's a handful of different levers and, and strings that we can pull to incentivize researchers to work with Adobe and spend their effort bug hunting for us as opposed to you know name your other a, a big tech company. Um, so things like you know uh, showing up as a dynamic, responsive bug bounty program generally uh, sits well with that external researcher, making them feel a part of the process and, and engaging with them throughout the remediation. Um, of course, we can always raise and lower our bounty uh, payouts to incentivize different types of researchers, as well as engaging with different types of assets, right? including mobile apps, desktop apps, web applications into the bug bounty program to really pull and attract different types of researchers from around the world with different backgrounds and skill sets. Yeah, I mean, we all know there's people out there that want to utilize information to cause harm. There's ones that want to, you know, try and help the cyber realm be more secure. And then in all honesty, um, there's very smart people in our field who just want to prove that something is right or wrong or fixable, broken, can be broken. So I think that program, um, I've read a lot about it since I knew that me and you were going to speak about it. Um, and I knew there were things like that out there, I guess, but it, it, was, it was a really good information. And some of the uh, links that you provided um, were very helpful. So I appreciate that. So there, so there are some challenges to this, right? We, you talked a little bit about it. Um, so, uh, but based off of your experiences, um, do you have any valuable lessons or anything that you've learned since you've been a part of, you know, this program and the team you work on that you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah. Um, I think generally there's, there's two main motives that we, you can, you can uh, abstract from a bug bounty program. The first one being recon, and then the second one being validation. Um, and when we leverage both at Adobe. Um, so from a recon perspective, we will incentivize the, the bug hunting for a particular vulnerability class or a particular product, or we'll narrow down the scope by the aforementioned uh, um, strings and levers we can pull to really learn and measure uh, the susceptibility to certain vulnerabilities in a product. So a really good example would be, let's say Adobe wants to measure um, phishing across all of our products and services. We might leverage our bug bounty program and do a two month campaign where any phishing phishing simulation you can demonstrate will get a 2X or 3X bug bounty payout. That data that we learn in that campaign of whatever our third party security researchers are able to dig up, we will then take that internally and pinpoint the particular products or services that are clearly uh, weak or or not resilient against that particular vulnerability class. The other 
metric that we, we measured that I mentioned is, is validation. So let's say, again, after we go through this whole process of securing our products against phishing, we think we have a pretty good handle on it. Let's go again back to our external security research or some of our most valuable resources at Adobe and offer them 3x, 4x, 5x the bounty if you can come back and demonstrate another phishing opportunity. That'll enlighten our teams internally into gaps uh, in, our, in our scanning, in, in our, our metrics, and in our product resilience. Wow. It sounds like a, a well, I mean, your team internally to Adobe really handles all of this uh, bug bounty responsibility. Yes, we do have a, a phenomenally dedicated hacker one triage team that'll act as the, that first line of defense. Um, they do uh, parse out you know, duplicate reports and, and reports that are maybe lacking a valid security impact. Um, and they also do help to reproduce some of the vulnerabilities, but then it's passed into the Adobe PSER team where we will validate and assess that vulnerability once again, and then work with our product engineering teams to facilitate uh, a mitigation. I'm pretty sure with a, a lot of very good information that you, you know, get from programs like this, you also get a lot of, uh, what's the right way to say it, like cannon fodder, <laughs> a lot of, uh, uh, not so much useful information. So it requires, a uh, really skilled folks to go through and figure out what's relevant what's important to, as you said, move it on up to the skill chain or whatever it may be. Yeah. I think even if it's not, you know, I think to some extent, all security researchers are valuable. And even if they're not val you know, demonstrating a valid security impact, it, it will still fuel our adversary Intel and, and show kind of what the broader community, what they're looking at, what they're considering in terms of potential exploits. Um, and, you know, in theory, even if the certain researcher is not able to demonstrate a valid exploit chain this time around, you know, it, it will still glean some insight into potential vulnerabilities down the line. That's a very good point. I'm glad you, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, so is there anything else you'd like to share with our uh, listeners at all? I think the other thing that's important to mention is, you know, we leverage the adversary Intel and the personification of these adversaries for uh, incident response as well. The past year and a half that we've been working on this project, we, we've been able to do a lot of proactive um, uh, resilience building for our products. And you mentioned earlier the, the blue team. Um, we do work side by side with our Adobe blue team to anytime that we monitor some kind of exploit going on out there in, in the world or CVEs being exploited, um, you know, we'll work with our blue team and, and subsequently the incident response process to make sure that we have monitoring coverage and we have detections in place to detect if that happens to Adobe. Is that like, do you, do you and that's just a question, do you do sort of like threat hunting in sense at all? Or is it just, you know, you know of a, a vulnerability and you, you pass it off to whether it be the blue team or whatever and scans to make sure that you guys aren't susceptible to the same issue? Yeah, so that's not uh, it's not on the PSER team, but we do have a threat hunting team at Adobe, and they do use our data and our intel to kind of fuel those threat hunts, right? Whether it's some third party exploit going on in the world, or even if it's some exploit within Adobe that we're tracking down and, and uh, running an incident response on, our threat hunt team will usually get engaged to look in other products, other services, other avenues where that exploit might also be uh, exploitable. So, I mean, the key there is it seems like Adobe, you guys have a lot of different, different teams that share a lot of pertinent information to, to help your mission as a whole move forward in a successful manner. I mean, it's it sounds amazing to me. Yeah, thank you. It, it is very interesting. And I'm very energized uh, um, and, and passionate about it. Um, I think it really helps kind of break down the barriers between those vague, ominous threat actors out there in the world. And, and kind of gain some transparency with our internal engineering teams to help them understand um, the most likely uh, persona to exploit their product or service. We talk about communication and, and things like that. I think things like having a conversation with people in your field and other fields um, and learning from that. I mean, we can all go to school and learn lots of different things, but if we don't share information, it's, it's really difficult 
for um, us all to, you know, to be stronger in our field. So I appreciate your time. You know, I, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to come on and, and, and say my piece. And it was, I had a fun yeah, time. Absolutely. I mean, I had a really good time. Um, if if the opportunity comes um, forth in the future, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out um, to ISACA because I, I think that a lot of good conversation could be had because um, I'm going to start looking into Adobe a little bit more just to learn a little bit more because that's what I like doing, being responsible for what I am at, at my job here at ISACA um, to help other folks to learn things. Um, so thank you very much. I hope to see you again. And to everybody else, I'll see you in the next podcast. Thanks.